Hello and welcome to Unacademy, a one-stop destination for the English medium civil services aspirants. A very good morning and welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's begin today's discussion by first looking at the topics that we are going to discuss. From the daily edition of the Hindu, I have chosen 11 important articles that are relevant for our prelims and mains. We have four big articles today which are more relevant for our mains examination and they require a thorough analysis. We have many small articles as well that are equally important for your prelims. So let's carry out a detailed analysis of today's The Hindu so that you don't have to go back and read the newspaper again. If you guys are benefiting from these initiatives, do support us with your likes, your comments and also don't forget to the subscribe button. And also we have a very very important announcement. Starting from tomorrow, we will be bringing out a few new limited series throughout the month of April on our YouTube channel. Every day from Monday to Saturday at 7 p.m. We shall go live on the YouTube channel and this week, the coming week, from 1st to 5th of April, I will be taking up some of the most controversial topics from India's foreign policy. You can take a look at the topics that we are going to discuss, so do join me live and for that you have to subscribe to the channel as well. And we also go through the comments that you are sharing and we know that a lot of you are expecting us to quickly start the current affairs crash course. So don't worry, we are going to start Conquer Prelims 2024 from 1st of May. We'll ensure that the timing is appropriate to help you prepare for the prelims, which now has been scheduled on the 16th of June. So starting from 1st May, over a period of three weeks, we will help you revise and cover all the important current affairs of the last one year. So do subscribe to our channel and look forward to all these new initiatives that we are going to present in April and May. With this, let's begin with the discussion of today's The Hindu newspaper by looking at this article from page number 7. This article is very, very important for internal security, especially under the chapter of money laundering. It is specifically related to money laundering, which is an important topic under internal security. So this article is talking about the FATF and its views and recommendations regarding regulation of virtual assets and virtual asset service providers or also known as WASPs. So this is a very important topic. It is slightly technical as well and it is very, very crucial to un understand what is FATF, why does it deal with virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. So in this discussion today, we will completely break, break down this topic and understand all the relevant points that are needed for your prelims and even for your mains. So first, let's focus on what is FATF, what is Financial Action Task Force. We'll also understand the concept of virtual assets and virtual asset service providers and what has FATF observed about these virtual assets and WASPs. Because according to a recent FATF report, many countries and jurisdictions, they are not following FATF standards when it comes to regulating virtual assets and WASPs. That's what the article is talking about. So to understand this, you need to know the basics. So first, let's understand what exactly is FATF. FATF stands for Financial Action Task Force. It's an intergovernmental body that was established in 1989 by the G7 group of countries. When it was established, its primary purpose was to tackle the menace of money laundering. It is essentially a global policy making body and it recommends a set of standards which needs to be followed and implemented by jurisdictions and member countries around the world. It provides for few regulatory measures, policy measures that need to be taken, which has to be adopted in the form of a national law that is passed by the respective parliaments and legislatures. So when it was established, FATF had only one mandate. It had only one objective, which was to implement anti-money laundering measures. Because by 1980s, money laundering had become a huge global economic menace. Money laundering is essentially the practice, the illegal practice 
of converting black money into white that is wealth generated through illegal sources if it is converted into legal wealth through a fraudulent process that process is called money laundering this was posing a grave economic threat to countries around the world so that is why the g7 industrialized nations they came together to establish the fatf today fatf has 39 members there are 39 member countries which includes india as well india is one of the members of fatf and there are two regional groupings which are also members of fatf so upsc might ask you which are the two regional groupings that are members of fatf the answer is the european union which is represented by the european commission which is the executive arm of the eu and also the gcc the gulf cooperation council these two regional groupings they are members of fatf as well along with 39 countries so india is one of the members so fatf which is headquartered in paris at oecd the organization of economic cooperation and development it's a european economic grouping which is headquartered in paris so that is where the secretariat of fatf is also located so fatf has nine regional styled bodies there are nine FATF styled regional bodies that help in implementing and in enforcing the standards of FATF. Like for Asia Pacific region, there is a regional FATF body. For Latin America, North America, Europe, like this for different regions, in total we have nine FATF styled regional bodies which work with the parent organization, the FATF. So, they recommend these global standards with regard to countering money laundering. Technically, it's called AML measures or anti-money laundering measures. And it's not just the member countries uh, and the members who are obligated to follow FATF standards. But all jurisdictions around the world are expected to oblige by FATF standards and implement this through a national law. They need to pass legislations at the national level which incorporates these policy measures and regulatory uh, provisions as recommended by FATF to counter the menace of money laundering. But in 2001, following the 9-11 attacks, which was a deadly terror attack carried out by Al-Qaeda against the United States, a second objective was added to this organization. Because in this attack, the 9-11 attacks carried out by Al-Qaeda, a clear link was established between money laundering channels and terrorist financing. It very clearly emerged following the 9-11 attacks that there exists a direct connection between money laundering and terrorist financing. Because these activities are connected with organized criminal activities. In fact, if you're dealing with the world of security, especially counter-terrorism and if you're countering organized crime and money laundering, you will notice a direct connection between these three entities. Terrorist groups, they often work with organized criminal organizations which are involved in drug trafficking, arms trafficking and human trafficking. And all the illegal wealth that they are generating, they often launder this and get it converted into legal wealth. Or they might have a need to move the money around without raising suspicion. And they rely on money laundering channels, which includes Havala networks or Havala transactions. So there exists this direct link, a triangular uh, connection between terrorist financing, organized crime and money laundering. So as this link became clear after 9-11 attacks, FATF was given a second objective, which was to implement counter-terrorist financing measures. Technically known as CTF, counter-terrorist financing measures. So today, these are the two objectives of FATF. One is to implement AML measures or anti-money laundering measures, which has been there from the very beginning, from the very start of FATF. And the second goal is to implement CTF measures or counter-terrorist financing measures that was added as a second objective in 2001. So to 
ensure that these regulations are implemented and to enforce them, the FATF has the power of review. It can conduct periodic review of member countries and jurisdictions to check whether they are implementing and following these standards. And if anyone is lacking, if anyone is deliberately lagging behind when it comes to implementation of these standards, those countries and jurisdictions can even be penalized and punished by the FATF. So let's understand what kind of obligations are placed on a member country or a jurisdiction according to these FATF standards. Now, for example, countries are obligated to follow and abide by any international conventions which includes UN resolutions as well. Let's say there is a UN resolution that urges all UN members to tackle terrorist financing. Let's say there is a UN resolution calling for sanctions on global terrorists like 1267 resolution which provides for the establishment of the 1267 sanctions committee. All these resolutions of the UN and any related international conventions against money laundering, organized crime and terrorist financing, they have to be followed and implemented by the member countries. For example, there is a UN convention that deals with organized crime. There is a number of uh, resolutions of UN Security Council and even UN General Assembly against terrorist financing. So these global norms will have to be followed by the member countries. That is one of the obligation. Next, these countries have to pass a law, a national legislation that will criminalize the offense of money laundering. It should be declared as a criminal offense. For example, India has enacted the PMLA, Prevention of Money Laundering Act. This is how India abides by FATF norms. Under the PMLA, India has declared money laundering as a criminal offence. Accordingly, there should be a law enforcement agency, a directorate of enforcement or the enforcement directorate, which can enforce this law and it should be vested with adequate powers. For example, the ED should have the powers to confiscate the proceeds of the crime. If any money laundering case comes up and if it's being investigated by the Directorate of Enforcement, the ED should have the authority under the law to confiscate the proceeds of money laundering and attach that to the ongoing case. This is a mandatory provision recommended by FATF. Similarly, there should be a dedicated intelligence agency, a financial intelligence unit or FIU to keep a check on suspicious financial transactions happening in the banking and financial system of that country. So for example, India has established FIU India, Financial Intelligence Unit India. So this is how countries are expected to meet their obligations to the FATF. They should have a directorate of enforcement as a dedicated law enforcement agency to counter money laundering. They should have a dedicated financial intelligence unit, just like how India has established. There should be a national law like PMLA, declaring money laundering as a criminal offence and the ED should be vested with the authority to confiscate the proceeds of the crime and attach the proceeds of the crime to the ongoing case. The financial intelligence unit and the concerned authorities, they can enforce certain regulations on the banking and financial system to keep a check on any fraudulent transactions, on any suspicious activity linked with money laundering, organized crime and terror financing. They can keep a check on the back end of the banking and financial system. They can mandate the banks, the financial institutions to maintain proper records. Record keeping standards will have to be prescribed according to FATF standards. Proper diligence, customer due diligence, which is nothing but your KYC norms has to be strictly implemented. Any bank or financial institution which is receiving deposits, giving out loans or conducting these uh, financial transactions for their customers, they should know who their customers are. They should obtain enough identification proof from them. They should know their address and other basic details.
through which the sender and the recipient can be identified. In any financial transaction, there is a sender and a recipient. It's important for the authorities to know who is the sender and who is the recipient in any financial transaction. That is how you can keep vigilance and maintain a check on any fraudulent, suspicious activity. So ensuring customer due diligence is the responsibility of the banks and financial institutions which has to be regulated by the concerned regulators. From RBI to finance ministry, IT, IT department, the financial intelligence unit, right? Enforcement directorate, they all have this obligation to ensure that these standards are implemented in the banking and financial system. Record keeping standards have to be maintained. And if they detect any suspicious transaction, they need to report this to the concerned authorities. Immediately red flags have to be raised by the banking system, by the financial institutions and have to report to the authorities about any suspicious transaction. So this reporting system should be established on the back end. All these are FATF obligations. These countries also have to cooperate internationally. Since money laundering can be a, a international transnational uh, offense, which can happen over multiple countries and jurisdictions, international cooperation is absolutely necessary to counter the menace of money laundering. So all the member countries and even all jurisdictions, even though they are not members of FATF, they are obligated to cooperate internationally and assist each other in investigating cases of money laundering. So these are some obligations that get placed on FATF members and other jurisdictions as well, even on non-FATF members. And FATF has the power of periodic review. Periodically, it can review the countries and jurisdictions to check whether they are complying with the standards. It can check for compliance. And if any country is deliberately um, lagging behind in implementing the standards, if a certain country is not serious about countering money laundering, if it's not implementing these uh, standards, then such countries can be warned by FATF by placing it on the grey list. Officially, it's called other monitored jurisdictions. They basically come under enhanced monitoring by FATF. Such countries will invite enhanced monitoring by FATF, where FATF will keep a close watch on such countries which are not following the standards, which are not implementing these standards. So these grey listed countries come under the enhanced supervision of FATF. This itself might be seen as some part of economic sanctions or partial economic sanctions. Because with grey listed countries, many global institutions and investors, they don't like to work with such countries. It means that they have very poor standards against money laundering. It means that the state agencies might be enabling terrorist financing as well or allowing money laundering to happen. So such jurisdictions which get grey listed, right? Their international image will get affected Investors will hesitate to invest the money in such countries and even financial institutions and global development banks, they will hesitate to provide loans and funds to such grey listed countries. But however, grey listing is just a warning. It's just a notice given by FATF. Once a country is grey listed, it is given an action plan by FATF with specific targets to be achieved within a given deadline. A certain deadline is prescribed and an action plan is recommended by FATF to plug the loopholes that exist in that country's banking and financial system. So specific target areas are also identified and these have to be achieved through regulatory changes and legal changes that are needed. So if a country shows the progress, if a country shows that it is serious about implementing these measures, then FATF might remove that country from the grey list. After placing it on grey list for few months or few years, if a country shows the progress in achieving these targets of the action plan, FATF might even remove that country from the grey list. But however, if a country deliberately keeps breaking FATF standards, even after getting grey listed, if the country shows no interest in following these global standards, in the worst case, FATF can blacklist those countries. Those countries can be blacklisted and officially they are designated as non-cooperative territories. Non-cooperative countries or non-cooperative territories. 
meaning these countries are deliberately not cooperating with FATF and the global community and they are enabling money laundering and terrorist financing. Once a country is blacklisted, this invites crippling economic sanctions on that country. It, be, it will become very difficult for a blacklisted country to trade with the rest of the world. It won't be able to export to other countries easily or import from other countries easily. There will be complete trade restriction on such a country. So foreign trade will get disrupted. No investor would like to invest in a blacklisted country. Foreign investments will completely stop. Global financial institutions, development banks like World Bank and others, they will not provide any loans or development funding to these countries. The credit rating, the sovereign credit rating of these countries will be downgraded to the status of junk and investments will completely dry up leading to complete financial isolation of these countries. They will be completely cut off from the global economy. So this is going to destroy the economy of these blacklisted countries. As of now, there are three countries which are blacklisted by FATF. Now can you find out which are these three countries and mention that in the comments below. Is that clear? That's a small assignment for you. As of now, there are three blacklisted countries by FATF. They are suffering the impact of these economic sanctions because they were non-cooperative. They never cared about uh, implementing and following these standards. So three countries have been declared as non-cooperative territories by FATF. So please mention in the comments, which are these blacklisted countries? Pakistan, for example, our dear neighbor, has been graylisted multiple times. It's a regular offender because of efforts by India and few other countries like France and US and others, they have repeatedly pushed Pakistan to get, get grey listed at FATF because it has not been tackling money laundering and terrorist financing. So at least on three different occasions in the last uh, 10 to 12 years, Pakistan has been grey listed. Every time it will show some progress and then it will get removed from the grey list. For example, recently in 2018, it was grey listed. And it remained on the grey list for almost 3-4 years. And just last year it was removed from the grey list by FATF. So this is essentially the role, the mandate and the functions of FATF. Now, let us understand what are virtual assets. That's what the article was talking about. Let's understand what are WASPs, virtual asset service providers, right? Let's focus on this and then we'll discuss the content of the article. Virtual assets refer to crypto assets or digital currencies. Your cryptocurrencies, which are largely based on blockchain technology, like Bitcoin, for example, and other such virtual assets, they are referred to as the virtual assets under FATF's classification. So all your cryptocurrencies and digital currencies, right? They are recognized as virtual assets. According to FATF's definition, it is any digital currency or digital asset which has a store of value, which is seen as a tradable uh, digital asset, which can store some value. You can transfer this to someone else. You can use this to make payments online through digital methods. And it is seen as a store of value, which can be transferred from one person to another or one entity to another. So any such digital asset, which is a digital representation of any value, which is seen as a store of value, which can be transferred to others, used as payment uh, through online methods. Such assets are called virtual assets. So essentially, it's a reference to crypto assets, crypto and digital currencies. Is that clear? But however, it does not include digital currencies that are tied to fiat currencies. That is official digital currencies issued by central banks and governments. They don't fall under this definition. Now, for example, in India, India's central bank, the RBI, has brought out a digital rupee. So India's digital rupee, right, it is directly tied to the fiat currency, which is the Indian rupee. So the digital rupee of India will not fall under the definition of virtual asset. Why? Because it's a fiat currency, it's a legal tender, which has been given validity by the central bank and by the government of that country. Right? It has 
a certain sovereign value attached to it. So they are not treated as virtual assets. But any other digital store of value, any digital asset representing a certain value, right, which is used to transfer to others or make payments to others, they are treated, treated as these virtual assets. For example, even NFTs, non-fungible tokens, you might, you might have seen how artists have tried to convert their work of art into NFTs, from paintings to music to movies, etc. And then this is traded, traded as a digital store of value. And it's used to make payments as well. So all these virtual digital assets fall under the definition of virtual assets. But if it is a digital fiat currency, right, then it's not classified as a virtual asset, like, a, like the digital rupee of India, for example. So these virtual assets are risky assets according to the FATF. Of course, they have many benefits, right? They have many benefits. They offer you uh, protection against inflation. These are decentralized currencies which are not regulated by anyone. And they do provide many advantages. There are a lot of benefits that arise out of uh, the correct usage of cryptocurrencies and other digital assets. For example, NFTs have a big advantage. You can use NFTs to further com commercialize art and generate revenue for artists, right? Thus incentivizing them to create more art. But at the same time, the NFTs can be misused for terrorist financing. It can be misused for money laundering. The same concern exists with other crypto assets like Bitcoins, Ethereum, and all these other virtual assets. They do have a lot of advantages and benefits if it's used in the right manner. But if it is used in a malicious intention, with a malicious intention, it can be easily misused for money laundering and terrorist financing. Because most of these virtual assets, they provide complete anonymity to the users. You can remain fully anonymous. The sender and the recipient can remain anonymous and their identity, their location can be completely masked. That's the very nature of these cryptocurrencies, right? The transfers are happening between these encrypted addresses and you can't find out who's the person or the entity behind these transactions. So this makes it very lucrative for criminals, terrorists, and other miscreants to misuse these assets to enable money laundering and terrorist financing. That is why FATF treats this class of assets as a separate class, as virtual assets, and it includes any digital uh, asset or value which is seen as a store of value, which can be used for uh, transferring to other people or making payments. All these assets are seen as virtual assets. So FATF places certain regulatory restrictions and provisions on those entities who are enabling these transactions, right? There are many startups and tech companies which provide various digital services like a trading exchange for cryptocurrencies, for example. You have many popular uh, trading apps like Wazirx, Coinbase, and many others, right? Then you also have several crypto wallets and digital wallets where you can store the value, where, which you can use to make payments to others. So all these service providers, these tech-based apps and companies which provide the service to store and transfer these virtual assets, they are called as WASPs, Virtual Asset Service Providers. All the crypto companies essentially, even the ones involved in crypto mining, in uh, offering crypto trading exchanges, those who are providing uh, crypto wallets or digital wallets where you can store these digital assets. All these tech companies, all these companies, right, they are classified as WASPs, virtual asset service providers. Just like banks and financial institutions provide uh, you the feature with transaction and to store your uh, fiat currency. Similarly, these WASPs are the ones who are enabling the transaction of these virtual assets. So they are placed under enhanced scrutiny by the FATF and FATF expects all countries and jurisdictions to monitor them and to regulate them. This, this I have taken directly from FATF's website. FATF says that these are entities which are enabling the exchange of virtual assets, the storing of virtual assets, making payments through virtual assets. So FATF mandates every country and jurisdiction to regulate these entities to place them under strict monitoring and regulation because these assets can be easily misused to enable money laundering and terrorist financing. 
Is that clear? So last year, the FATF held a summit, a plenary meeting was held, where all FATF regional bodies came together, along with several member countries and jurisdictions. And they all resolved to implement FATF standards to regulate these virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. The FATF came out with a regulatory standard to regulate virtual assets and WASPs last year. So now, after one year, the FATF has conducted a review. After one year of coming out with the regulatory standards, it has conducted a review of all the countries, how they are implementing the standards, and it has submitted a report. So that is why the topic is in news. You can expect a mains question here. UPSC might ask you, how does FATF treat virtual assets and WASPs? What recommendations has it come out with? Or why does FATF treat virtual assets as a security risk? What are countries expected to do with regard to virtual assets and WASPs? So such questions can be asked. And that is why the topic becomes very, very important. So coming to the last point, the FATF expects all the member countries and jurisdictions to take effective action against the misuse of virtual assets and uh, even regulate all the WASP entities. For example, countries are obligated to bring out a law that provides for regulatory provisions which will mandate all the WASPs to be licensed and registered. Let's say, for example, in India, if there is any virtual asset service provider who is operating, maybe the company is based out of India, or it has Indian customers who are investing in cryptocurrencies or trading in digital assets. All these entities have to be mandatorily registered with the concerned Indian authorities. They have to be licensed by the concerned Indian authorities so that the Indian government can keep a check on their activities. This is a mandatory provision. This is an obligation on all the countries. They have to create a legal regulatory mechanism for licensing and registering all the WASPs and they have to supervise the transactions. They have to keep a check on these uh, transactions that are happening and flag any suspicious activity which could be connected to money laundering and terrorist financing. Even the WASPs have few obligations. The service providers, even they are obligated to implement the preventive measures to ensure that these assets are not misused for money laundering and terrorist financing. And more importantly, they have to implement a rule called the travel rule of FATF. The travel rule of FATF essentially refers to tracking the travel route of money. When any money or asset or value is moved from one entity to another or one individual to another, there is a certain route the money is taking, the asset is taking. Essentially, it's the route between the sender and the receiver. Now, for example, imagine I'm sending you 100 bitcoins through a certain trading platform. So there is a certain route that this asset is taking when I make the transfer happen. So keeping track of this entire route between the sender and the receiver, identifying who is the sender, identifying who is the receiver, and tracking the middleman involved in enabling the transaction, right? This essentially refers to the travel route. This is a rule that should be followed by all countries and by the companies. They have to ensure that they maintain the travel rule. They have to monitor how the money is traveling, the assets are traveling. This is already implemented with your fiat currencies. Most countries have already implemented these FATF standards to track how money is moving from one sender to another receiver. But with virtual assets, it has become a challenge because of the anonymity that they offer. So that is why FATF is expecting the countries and as well as the WASPs who are involved in between to check and implement the travel rule and ensure that they are monitoring every single transaction. Identify the sender, exercise due diligence, implement the customer due diligence, that's your KYC norms, maintain the record keeping standards, ensure appropriate records are maintained and the transactions are correctly recorded 
and any suspicious transaction has to be reported to the concerned authorities. So these obligations are placed by FATF on member countries and jurisdictions and the WASPs need to be regulated by the concerned governments through appropriate laws and regulatory provisions. So this is how FATF deals with virtual assets and WASPs. So according to this report, the review report that FATF has published, there are certain concerns that are still existing. FATF has consulted with all the regional styled FATF bodies with all its uh, 41 members, 39 member countries and two regional organizations and with other stakeholders including the private sector, including the, the WASP entities and the tech companies which are involved in crypto transactions. It has held a consultation with all the stakeholders and brought out some of these key findings. For example, with regard to India, the FATF is very satisfied that India is already acting on these standards. India already maintains a close watch on crypto transactions and virtual asset transactions in the country. The RBI and even the finance ministry and even uh, the enforcement directorate and financial intelligence unit they all maintain a check on crypto transactions and virtual asset transactions. There are certain regulatory provisions in India. For example, at one point, India had banned, prohibited all virtual asset transactions. Now we are opening up, we are trying to mainstream these virtual asset transactions and through taxation, through high taxation, the government is trying to mainstream these crypto assets at the same time discourage any small time investors from getting duped. Because through these virtual assets, lot of scams, frauds are pulled off. Since they don't have any real value, right? Their value can be artificially inflated and thus attract investments from, from uh, uh, amateur retail investors. And then they might lose their entire money, whereas the fraudsters might make all the profits. So there are many risks associated with these crypto and virtual assets. And FATF appreciates India that India is already keeping a check on these activities. India has done a risk assessment. India has been compliant with the standards of FATF. We are already trying to enforce the anti-money laundering counter-terrorist financing measures. Is that clear? The virtual asset service providers in India are regulated by various laws, including the IT Act and other related uh, legislations and regulations in India. RBI keeps a close check on these activities. So India has even taken some enforcement action against the violators. We are trying to implement the travel rule to keep a check on the sender and recipient in every transaction. Alright, so in this regard, FATF has expressed its satisfaction with India. But however, it is yet to complete the evaluation and give a rating to India. Is that clear? It has only made these observations in the report. It is yet to complete its evaluation of India and give a rating to India's performance. It also talks about other countries, what other countries are doing uh, when it comes to regulating virtual assets. For example, some countries have completely prohibited virtual assets like China, Egypt, Saudi Arabia and others. They place a complete prohibition on any kind of uh, virtual asset transaction. There are few countries which are considering a ban like Seychelles and Indonesia. So please remember this, it could be asked as a prelims question. And FATF has expressed concern as well that many jurisdictions are yet to follow the standards. Many territories, they are yet to follow the standards that this concern is also expressed by FATF. But the final point that we should understand in summary, right, is that these virtual assets, since they are transnational or transboundary in nature, it is very important to enforce the regulations in every country and jurisdiction or else the misuse of these assets will have global implications. These assets can be used to move money or value around from one country to another to evade authorities and detection. It can be easily used as a safe haven for money laundering and terrorist financing. So it not only represents an economic threat, it also represents a national security threat. So that is why FATF is strictly acting against virtual assets and virtual asset service providers. So these are the key points that we take away from this article, right? We have gone way beyond the article and covered this entire topic so that you don't have to go and read this again.
if you listen to the session for the last, uh, I think, 30, 40 minutes, the entire topic has been covered. It will give you all the points needed for your prelims and your mains. So I hope you've understood everything. Now let's look at the next article, which is in a way related to what we just studied. On page number nine, we have another article related to internal security under GS paper three. This article is referring to the emergence of cyber fraud centers across Southeast Asian countries. Especially in Southeast Asian countries such as Myanmar, Laos and Cambodia and even in parts of Thailand and China. Number of cyber fraudulent centers have come up. They are almost like IT companies or large tech uh, companies that are operating here. But they are all shady criminal organizations involved in cyber crime and cyber frauds. This has become a huge headache for India and India is getting directly impacted by the development of these cyber fraud centers in Southeast Asia. So let's take a look at this important topic. Now in the map, you're looking at a region called the Golden Triangle region. This right here is the Golden Triangle that covers Myanmar, Thailand and Laos PDR. These three countries are considered to be part of the Golden Triangle which is a hub of organized criminal activities. In fact, it's identified by the global community, by United Nations. The name itself was coined by the US, uh, its intelligence agency, the CIA, which was tracking drug trafficking and criminal cartels around the world. Coined the name Golden Triangle for this particular region, which is a hub of drug trafficking, drug production and other associated criminal activities. So there is a similar region to the west of India as well. It's called the Golden Crescent. To the west of India, towards our western borders, a similar region exists called Golden Crescent that also includes three countries in that region. Now, can you find out which are the three countries part of Golden Crescent and mention that in the comments below. So, to the east of India, towards India's eastern borders, we are bound by this region called Golden Triangle, which is a hub of all types of illicit and criminal activities. From drug trafficking to arms trafficking, from wildlife tra trafficking to human trafficking, to even cyber crimes and online frauds, they're all very rampant and prevalent in this region. This has even spread to Cambodia over here, which is present in the same neighborhood. And especially here in the border areas of the Yunnan province of China and the Shan state of Myanmar, Several cyber fraud centers have come up which employ thousands of people. Thousands of IT professionals are employed by these fraudulent companies and in most cases, these people are duped. They are trafficked over here, forced to work in these criminal centers and they are carrying out these uh, cyber crimes and cyber frauds which is affecting India quite massively. If you remember the other day we spoke about cyber crimes. We spoke about the different uh, scams that are carried out through social media platforms and, and other communication platforms. We discussed how we might get these fraudulent WhatsApp calls or uh, WhatsApp messages or Telegram messages asking us to invest in a crypto scheme or asking us to transfer money in order to receive a lottery amount. Right? We discussed these examples. Do you know where all these calls and messages are largely originating from? It's largely coming from this region that we are talking about. For example, in India also, there is one such hub, which is seen as a hub of uh, online fraud and, and cyber scams, which is Jamtara. Right? In fact, you might have seen the popular Netflix series as well on Jamtara. So just like that, there is an entire region in Southeast Asia, which has become a hub of these online fraudulent companies. What's interesting to note is that most of these cyber fraud companies present here they're all connected to Chinese entities. So there are several Chinese criminal cartels involved in running these criminal centers present in Myanmar, in Thailand, in Cambodia, Laos. So this whole region has become a, a hub of these criminal centers. If you look at some of the images of these criminal centers, they even look like IT companies or tech parks. They employ IT engineers, software professionals. In most cases, they are duped. They are duped by middlemen 
who promised them a good lucrative IT job and then they push them to commit online scams and cyber frauds. They don't let them escape, they trap them. They force them and coerce them to commit these fraudulent activities. And unfortunately, several Indians, thousands of Indians are trapped in these countries. Now, this is a map that I've taken from the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. It works closely with the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, which keep a track of criminal activities around the world. So according to this data, there are many such online scam centers that have come up along Myanmar-China border. Recently in the Shan state, the local armed insurgent groups, they have thrown out Myanmar's military, captured this whole region. And these online gambling centers and so-called IT centers are flourishing, which are actually owned by Chinese criminal cartels. Understood? Similarly, in Laos PDR, in Thailand and Cambodia as well, many such fraudulent scam companies have come up which employ IT professionals, cybersecurity experts, software engineers, and majority of them are actually duped to believe that these are genuine, well-paying jobs. So this has affected thousands of Indians according to reports coming out of this region. Thousands of Indian IT engineers, cybersecurity professionals and software engineers who look for lucrative jobs abroad, they have been deceived by the middlemen and the agents involved. They promise them a job in Southeast Asia. They say that you have a very good job offer in Thailand or in Vietnam, right? And they get them all the visas done. They get all the travel documents. They take them to these countries and then they are kidnapped. Usually it happens in Thailand, right? As no one would doubt uh, when they get a job offer from Thailand or Vietnam, they would take them here and usually they are kidnapped and pushed into Myanmar or Laos or Cambodia where these criminal centers are operating. And they have to conduct this, this role basically where they are involved in committing these scams. They are forced to do it, right? There is a threat to their life. They are not allowed to escape. They are given meager sums of money, they are abused as well and there is no way for them to escape. And thousands of Indians have been trapped that too these are IT professionals and software engineers. So this issue has acquired such an alarming proportion right now that the Indian government and the Ministry of External Affairs are closely monitoring the situation. The Indian embassies present over here along with Indian intelligence agencies are working together to rescue the Indians who are trapped. And few hundred Indian IT engineers have been rescued by the authorities and they have been safely brought back to India. But there are many more who are trapped in this region and there are people from many other countries as well who are duped and pushed into these criminal activities. So many of the fraudulent calls and messages you get, right, where uh, a guy on the phone is asking you to invest in a certain scheme, invest in cryptocurrencies, etc. Many times these calls are coming from Indian IT workers who are forced to work here and they are pushed through human trafficking cartels. You can see how these criminal activities are connected with money laundering. Large part of the funds can even land in the hands of terrorist groups that operate all across this region. And the bigger concern is many of the fraudulent companies have a Chinese connection. They are linked to Chinese entities. So there is a big risk of data being compromised which could represent a national security threat as well for India. So this is something India is watching very closely and please keep track of this developing story. Is that clear? So let's look at the next article from page number 11. The article is talking about tropical cyclones. So let's understand few basics about tropical cyclones and then focus on the article. The article is pointing out that because of global warming and climate change, we are witnessing more frequent and high intensity cyclones. And today the wind speed of a tropical cyclone has reached uh, very high levels. And accordingly, there is a need for a new category to classify these high intensity cyclones. That's what a few researchers have pointed out and the article is exploring this particular issue. So let's understand what exactly are tropical cyclones, just the basics. And then we'll come to the core point being discussed in the article. Tropical cyclones are essentially these destructive weather systems. 
it's a destructive weather system, a meteorological system, which usually forms in warm tropical seas and oceans that has a destructive effect. It's a major hazard in the coastal areas, in the tropical regions. And these tropical cyclones, they can bring very high speed winds. They can cause torrential rains. They can cause massive flooding, landslides, and even a coastal surge in the coastal areas. So when this turns into a disaster, it can leave behind a destructive impact, especially on the local coastal community, the fishing community. They will be very badly affected. Hundreds and thousands of people could get killed in these high intensity cyclones, right? Plus there will be large scale destruction to property and infrastructure. Standing crops can be destroyed. Fishing villages and fishing boats can be destroyed. Critical infrastructure present on the coastline from nuclear plants to power grids to roads and bridges could all be destroyed, causing severe economic losses along with loss of life and loss of uh, property as well. So today, we are facing a heightened risk of uh, more frequent and high intensity cyclones because of the changing climate. Due to global warming and, and uh, climate change, it's established that we are witnessing more frequent and intense extreme weather events, which includes tropical cyclones as well. So if you look at tropical cyclonic systems, right, they take shape or they form in the tropical belt around the world from Indian Ocean to the Pacific to the Atlantic. And there are few ideal conditions that are required for the formation of a tropical cyclone. They usually form in warm tropical waters where the sea surface temperature is about 26.5 to 27 degrees Celsius. That's one minimum criteria. For example, if you look at this image over here, it depicts the process of formation of a cyclone. In tropical waters, in tropical seas and oceans, during a few months, right? You do find these high temperatures, high sea surface temperature of 26 to 27 degrees Celsius, which is ideal for evaporation to accelerate. And the accelerated evaporation leads to the rising of warm, moist air, which rises up to form dense rain-bearing clouds. And this region will become a low pressure region, a depression. Due to the warming of the sea surface and the constant evaporation which is happening, the warm moist air will keep rising upwards. It will condense to form dense rain bearing clouds leading to the formation of a depression or a low pressure center. This will immediately attract winds from high pressure zones. From the nearby high pressure area, winds will rush towards the low pressure depression. And due to the Coriolis force, right? A vortex-like rotation, a cyclonic rotation is induced and you see the formation of a cyclonic system where the wind currents which are gushing towards the depression from high pressure areas, they will start circulating around the eye of the cyclone, the eye of the storm. The eye is a region of calm where you don't witness the violent activity but around the eye you witness these high speed winds which are accumulating and constantly rain bearing clouds are getting built up at the upper levels of the cyclonic system. So what fuels the cyclonic system is the constant supply of warm moist air. That is why the temperature is important. A temperature of 26, 27 degrees Celsius is critical because it will sustain the rate of evaporation and this is the fuel which is powering your cyclone. It's like how your vehicles are powered by a certain fuel so here, a fuel for the cyclone is the warm, moist air which is being constantly supplied by the tropical seas and the oceans. So this cyclonic system will start accumulating. It will become a massive cyclonic system that starts moving as well, right? And eventually, it might strike the continental land mass. We call that event as landfall. And when cyclone makes landfall, it brings torrential rainfall causing destructive floods, landslides and it essentially brings a disaster and it also brings very high speed winds. Wind speed could range between 150 kilometers per hour going above 300 kilometers per hour. These high speed winds can uproot everything in its path, destroy houses, vehicles, property, infrastructure 
leading to large scale loss of life and property. Right? And today, we are witnessing more such incidents and more intense uh, incidents like these. Now, if you look at the global distribution of tropical cyclones, they are distributed all around the tropical belt around the world. Be it the Pacific, the Atlantic, and the North Indian Ocean. All these are major hubs of tropical cyclones. For example, if you look at North Indian Ocean, every year in Arabian Sea and Bay of Bengal, we witness frequent tropical cyclones that strike India or Bangladesh or Myanmar or Sri Lanka or even Oman or Pakistan or Iran. So the entire North Indian, uh, Indian Ocean basin is affected by these tropical cyclones. But a more dangerous region is the Pacific. The Pacific Basin, right? The Western Pacific Basin is the most active region when it comes to tropical cyclones. Every year around 85 serious tropical storms are formed and more than half of them, right? More than half of them, they intensify into severe cyclones. Now that is a cause for concern. Out of 85 major tropical storms occurring around the world in all these basins, more than 50% of them are escalating into a severe cyclonic st storm. And large percentage of them are happening in Western Pacific, whereas North Indian Ocean Basin accounts for around 4% of these high intensity cyclones. But however, given the vulnerability of India and other countries in North Indian Ocean Basin, they are more vulnerable and more affected by the impact of these disasters. Is that clear? These high intensity cyclones that form in Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea, they can cause more damage and destruction given the vulnerability of the region itself. Given the lack of preparedness, the lack of disaster management measures, and given that many of them are developing countries present here, right? it might have a much more destructive impact. If you look at hurricanes in the Atlantic, uh, which mainly strikes west co the, the east coast of US, if you look at the typhoons that strike Philippines and even Japan and other countries in East Asia, right? Even they bring a lot of destructive impact. But countries like Japan, which are more developed, more advanced in disaster management, they are able to mitigate the impact, minimize the impact of these cyclones. But other countries, even India, even though India is much better prepared today, thanks to a solid disaster management architecture, still India is very vulnerable. And even the North Indian Ocean Basin accounts only for 4% of these high intensity cyclones. The impact is much higher in the North Indian Ocean Basin region. That is why the writers of the column are arguing that we need a new category to identify the, the extremely severe uh, cyclones. See, right now, there is a scale which is used for categorization of cyclone intensity. Please make a note of this. It's called the Safir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale. This is the global standard that is used to categorize cyclones based on their intensity. Right now, you have category 1 to category 5. And this mainly depends on the high wind speed. Depending on the wind speed, Cyclones are categorized into these five categories as per the Safir Simpson hurricane wind scale. If you look at category 5 cyclones, these category 5 cyclones will have a wind speed of 250 kilometers per hour and above. That is a threshold. But today, because of global warming and climate change and more extreme weather events, more extreme cyclones taking shape, we are witnessing wind speeds of 309 kilometers per hour and above. So that is why the experts are suggesting that there should be a new category here. Category 6 cyclone has to be recognized for wind speeds above 309 kilometers per hour. That is their recommendation. This categorization could help countries to be better prepared to deal with cyclone disaster management. Is that clear? As of now, under the Safir Simpson hurricane wind scale, there are only five categories and category five cyclones are those cyclones with a wind speed of about 250 kilometers per hour. But experts are arguing that this is already outdated. We are witnessing more intense cyclones today with wind speeds of 309 kilometers and above with greater destructive impact. So that's why they are suggesting that we should recognize a new category, category six, 
where cyclones with wind speeds of more than 309 kilometers per hour are categorized so that countries are more prepared and they can pay more attention when it comes to dealing with these disasters. So that's what we understand from this important article. Now coming to page number 12, we have this column that deals with the afforestation measures and, and the biodiversity conservation measures which are being undertaken around the world and how they could threaten indigenous communities and tribal communities. Now some of you might be confused by what I just said. How can afforestation and biodiversity conservation measures, how can it threaten indigenous community? It should actually benefit them, right? Let's understand how. Recently, a symposium was held amongst top conservationists and activists who reviewed some of the goals that have been set under the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This is a global biodiversity conservation framework adopted under the Convention on Biological Diversity or CBD. Under this, there are few targets to increase the protected areas around the world, to focus more on afforestation, to focus on conservation, protection of our habitats and ecosystems. This, of course, is good for the environment, right? It, it helps us in tackling climate change as well. But however, if you notify more areas as protected areas, if you implement more forest conservation rules and if you restrict the activity of forest dwelling tribes and indigenous communities, this will obviously have a socio-economic impact on the well-being of the indigenous communities. Now, for example, if you look at India's Wildlife Protection Act or if you look at Forest Conservation Amendment Act of 2023, they are all focused on forest conservation, wildlife, wildlife protection. But as we create more national parks, tiger reserves and, and wildlife sanctuaries and keep expanding these protected areas, it's good for the environment, good for biodiversity protection, but there is a social risk. It might lead to displacement of tribal communities. Indigenous forest dwelling communities may have to be relocated and if they are not adequately compensated and rehabilitated, it could affect their socio-economic well-being. We've already seen this happening in India. If you look at the tribal uh, inhabited forests of Chhattisgarh, Odessa, Northeast India, and even in parts of Western Ghats, several indigenous communities have been uprooted because of India's environmental laws. So this is a, essentially a balance that needs to be struck between environment protection and uh, tribal empowerment and tribal, uh, uh, tribal issues and tribal developmental concerns. So through the CBD convention, this framework was adopted at the conference of parties that was held in 2022. Two years ago, COP15 or the 15th conference of parties was held, which led to the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This summit was supposed to be held in Montreal in Canada, but due to the problems created by the pandemic, it was held at the last minute in Kunming, right, in China. That's why it's called Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. This was adopted at the end of COP15 of Convention on Biological Diversity. Just like you have Climate Change Convention that deals with climate change related issues. CBD was also established in the same uh, period to provide for biodiversity protection and conservation. In fact, both of them were born from Rio Earth Summit. When Rio Earth Summit was held in Brazil, in 1992, it gave rise to some important environment related conventions like UN Framework Convention on Climate Change to deal with climate change related issues. It also gave birth to CBD Convention, Convention on Biological Diversity to deal with biodiversity conservation protection. So just like annual summits or conference of parties happen under Climate Change Convention, similarly under CBD as well, conference of parties is held regularly. So during COP15 held in 2022, the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework was adopted to focus on biodiversity conservation around the world. The idea is to achieve the sustainable development goals of the UN and to ensure that the world will live in harmony with nature by 2050, to protect our natural ecosystems, to increase our uh, terrestrial and marine habitats and ensure that humans live in harmony with nature. That was the goal of uh, Kunming Montreal uh, GBF or Global Biodiversity Framework. 
So under this, four specific goals were identified to be achieved by the middle of the century. And 23 specific targets have been listed out to be achieved by the end of this decade, by 2030. So one target here is of concern. One specific goal and target, that's target uh, number three. This target calls for increasing our terrestrial, inland water and coastal and marine ecosystems, essentially the protected areas, to be increased to at least 30% of world's total terrestrial area. This is one of the targets adopted under Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework of Convention on Biological Diversity. The goal is to ensure that at least 30% of the world's terrestrial area is converted into protected areas by increasing the terrestrial ecosystems inland water and coastal and marine ecosystems so that we have more protected space where we can conserve nature, protect different species and thus protect biodiversity. This is definitely a great goal, a great target as far as the environment is concerned, as far as tackling climate change is concerned. But however, if you increase protected areas without adequate thought about indigenous communities, right, there will be devastating socio-economic consequences. As of today, the total extent of world's protected areas is at around 16%. 16% of world's terrestrial area is covered with protected areas like national parks, biosphere reserves, etc. So the goal is basically to almost double the protected land. This is the goal adopted to ensure 30% of the terrestrial area is covered with these protected ecosystems. So this is definitely good for nature, for environment and biodiversity. But what about the forest dwelling tribes? What if they are evicted because of laws like the Indian Forest Conservation Act? And also because of Wildlife Protection Act 1972. These laws have the right intention. The intention is to conserve our environment, protect the species, protect the biodiversity. But the same laws are responsible for tribal displacement. They have been responsible in eastern and northeastern India for increasing support for extremist insurgent activities as well. Some of the displaced tribal communities in Chhattisgarh, in Jharkhand, in Assam and other parts of northeast India, they have become vulnerable for radicalization by left-wing extremists. From Naxals to northeast insurgents, they have capitalized on the grievances of the tribal communities who are evicted, who are displaced because of these protected areas and environmental laws. So if you don't look at their socio-economic concerns and protect indigenous tribal communities, it will not only affect their well-being, it will affect their livelihood, but it could lead to resentment where these tribal communities could start resenting the state. And this resentment could be exploited by extremists to breed extremism and to trigger rebellions and insurgencies against the state. We have seen this across eastern India and also in northeast India. So these are the concerns being expressed by experts who attended this symposium where they reviewed the Kunming Montreal Global uh, Biodiversity Framework and specifically their focus was on this target which calls for doubling the protected areas around the world and how it might affect the indigenous tribal communities and forest dwelling tribes. So please pay attention to this topic, right? Even though the goal is very desirable, it's a very ambitious target laid down by CBD, it does raise these questions with regard to well-being of indigenous and tribal communities that dwell in forest areas. So this completes my detailed discussion of all the mains articles. Now let's take a quick look at the prelim section. On page number one, we have this image where Hindu is depicting the Bihu festival, which is going to be celebrated in the state of Assam in a couple of weeks. So it's an important topic under art and culture. So this Bihu, which will be celebrated in the month of April, it is known as Bohag Bihu or Rongali Bihu. Primarily, there are three different types of Bihu, which is marked and celebrated in Assam. First, you have Bohag Bihu or Rongoli Bihu. The second variety is Kati Bihu or Kongali Bihu. And the third one is Mag Bihu or Bogali Bihu. All the Bihu festivals essentially are harvest festivals. 
they are marked as the beginning of the new year, especially Bohag Bihu or Rongali Bihu, which is celebrated in second week of April. It's usually marked in second week of April. Right? This is seen as the Assamese New Year. It is a harvest season for rice, for paddy, and it is seen as a celebratory season. Right? So, the unique Bihu dance is performed with unique uh, customs that are part of this festival. So, this is closely related to other similar harvest festivals marked across India. Like Yugadi festival in uh, southern parts of India, in Karnataka and Andhra Pradesh. Right? It's marked around the same time, usually around the second week of April, which is again seen as the new year in, in these parts of India. Then, if you look at the other bihus that I was referring to, Mag Bihu, for example, it's closely connected with uh, the Sankranti Pongal festival and the Baisakhi festival celebrated across different parts of the country, which all mark the harvest season. So, if you specifically look at Assam and its harvest festivals, there are three types of bihus that are celebrated. So, please know the names and in which months are they marked and what is the significance, the cultural significance. It signifies the harvest season, it brings prosperity, right, because the produce has just been harvested and that's exactly what is celebrated here with unique customs, rituals and art forms. So, read more about the Bihu dance art form as well and other related customs associated with the festival. Next on page number 6, the article is referring to Fish otolith. I don't know how many of you have heard about fish otolith. It's one of the parts of a fish. Different species of fish, they have this, this scale-like or stone-like structure, which is largely made up of calcium carbonate, that's present just below the gills and the mouth of a fish. This is basically formed due to biomineralization, right? By, it, by using the calcium present in the, in the waters, the fish would have developed this unique uh, structure called an autolith. And it's actually very important for the, the fish. It essentially helps the fish to hear and to maintain a sense of balance. Just like our... ENT system, especially in the ear kennel, right? There is a balance which is maintained, which provides us bodily balance when you stand, when you walk. Um, people suffering from vertigo, right? They will actually have a, a problem with this fluid, right? That helps you in maintaining your balance, which is present in your ear kennel, right? Between your ENT system. Similarly, fishes have a structure, a calcium carbonate structure, a stone-like structure called the otolith. It's formed due to biomineralization, uh, which essentially, uh, you know, leads to absorption of calcium from the waters and it, it leads to formation and development of this structure called the otolith. And this gr keeps growing throughout the life of a, a fish. So, by looking at the otolith, you can guess the age of the fish. By looking at the lines, the scales that are present on it, you can e easily guess the age of the fish because it keeps growing every year throughout the lifetime of the fish. Now, why, why am I mentioning this? Why is the article mentioning this? Fish otoliths, they have ornamental value. Since ancient times, be it Romans or Egyptians, they have been using the otoliths and carving it to make ornaments. Is that clear? They collect the otoliths and they make these intricate carvings to turn that into a fine piece of jewellery. From earrings to pendants to rings, they are all produced through fish otoliths. So, this has a lot of commercial value and for the first time in India, this is being exploited. An uh, initiative has been taken up by the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute. It is working with women fishermen through self-help groups so that women can be imparted these skills, ornamental skills. Right? It will make women fishermen more financially independent. It will fetch additional income for the fishing communities in India. It will make them more self-reliant. And especially, it will uplift the women fisher folk thus bringing women empowerment as well. So, through this initiative, women fishermen through self-help groups are being provided with ornament making skills, right? They are learning how to work with fish otoliths, turn this into an ornament and this is going to be commercially marketed and sold as a piece of jewellery. So, please understand this, there could be a prelims question based on this topic. 
Next on page 6, there is an article referring to the BRT Tiger Reserve in Karnataka. Apparently, there has been a forest fire in the BRT Tiger Reserve and few locals who are responsible for uh, instigating the fire, they have been booked under Wildlife Protection Act. Apparently, few miscreants had lit a fire which went out of control, triggering a massive forest fire that has burnt around 60 acres of forest land. So you should know where BRT Tiger Reserve is located, what is its importance. Please look at the map, this is the state of Karnataka in south, southwest Karnataka. This is where the BRT Tiger Reserve is present. It was a wildlife sanctuary before, but now it's a tiger reserve as well under, the, under Project Tiger. BRT stands for Biligiri Ranganath Swami Temple. It's a historic temple located uh, within the protected area on top of a, a hillock or a mountain a structure. It's a very beautiful place and it's a critical habitat. It actually forms a connection between Western and Eastern Ghats and it's located in the Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve. Just like Satya Mangalam Tiger Reserve in Tamil Nadu, which forms a connection between Western and Eastern Ghats. Similarly, the BRT Tiger Reserve in Karnataka, which is part of the same Nilgiri Biosphere Reserve ecosystem, offers a connection between Western and Eastern Ghats. I am stressing on this point because UPSC had asked a prelims question. It had asked a question on the significance of Satya Mangalam Tiger Reserve, which acts as a corridor for gene flow to happen between the migratory species from Western to Eastern Ghats. So, a similar role is played by BRT Tiger Reserve in Karnataka, which acts as a connection between Western and Eastern Ghats, allowing the migratory species to move around and it enables gene flow of the population species that are found in Western and Eastern Ghats. So, that is the significance of BRT Tiger Reserve. Next, on page number 9, we have an article referring to the regulation of OTT platforms under the IT rules of 2021. See, OTT stands for over-the-top streaming platforms. Essentially, your Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Hotstar and many others. They all qualify to be known as OTT platforms or over-the-top digital platforms. So, this is a new form of communication media which previously was not regulated under any uh, rules or laws or by any authority. So, in 2021, IT rules were notified, the IT Intermediary Guidelines and Digital Media Ethics Code, Rules 2021, it was notified under the IT Act, under the Information Technology Act of 2000, these new IT rules were notified. So, this rules basically regulates your social media intermediaries, there is a separate set of uh, regulation that applies for social media uh, intermediaries like Meta, uh, then uh, uh, Twitter and th that is X and other social media platforms. So, another category which is regulated through the new IT rules is OTT platforms. So, let us see what kind of regulation is applied here because the topic is in news. According to the article, a streaming platform called Ulu or Ulu, right? It is a it's quite a notorious streaming platform known for streaming adult content, explicit, sexually explicit content. Apparently, this OTT platform was not following the standards recommended under IT rules. These concerns were raised by the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights, where allegations had come up that the platform has not taken care to ensure that adult content is not shown to minor children. Similarly, Google also pointed out a few discrepancies with this OTT platform and as a result, it has now been forced to comply with the IT rules. So, please understand how OTT platforms are regulated. OTT platforms, as they represent creative media, they are not subjected to very strict regulation. The government does not want to excessively interfere here because that would lead to government's interference with right to freedom of speech and expression. That is a fundamental right under Article 19. So, what the government has gone, gone with regard to OTT is that it's largely gone for self-regulation. It has brought out a set of rules and guidelines to promote self-regulation under the IT rules. So, every OTT platform has to self-implement these regulatory norms. 
and at the industry level, at the level of the entire OTT industry, there is a self-regulatory body which is set up for listening to grievances and complaints called the Digital Publisher Content Grievance Council. This is an industry level regulatory body that has representation of all OTT platforms operating in India. Is that clear? So every OTT company is responsible for its own content, meaning they have to ensure the content is appropriately rated. Let's say if any web series or movie has any adult content, if, if, if it shows usage of drugs or alcohol or cigarettes, let's say it is showing ex sexually explicit content or gore and violence, they have to clearly rate the content accordingly, show the rating at the start. Ensure that parental locks are added so parents can lock out their children, minor children from watching adult content. They have to clearly display a star rating and show the, the essentially the, the parameters that describe that particular movie or web series. And they have to issue a disclaimer at the start saying that this is what the content ca carries or contains. That if you're okay with it, you can go ahead and watch. The choice is up to the customer. If you don't want to watch any explicit content or uh, any questionable content, you can quit the show and you can ensure that you don't watch it. And you should also have the option to lock out such content, adult content, to ensure your children, minor children are not exposed to it. So all these self-regulatory measures have to be implemented. Most OTT companies have done it. For example, if you go to Netflix or Prime or Hotstar, the moment you play a new uh, movie or a web series, you clearly see a rating right whether it's universal or ua rated or adult rated it will also issue a disclaimer at the top mentioning what kind of content is present if it contains nudity uh, sexually explicit material or drug abuse alcohol abuse gore and violence it's all mentioned at the very beginning so then you can decide whether to choose to uh, whether to watch this or not plus parental locks are made available so all these are done on the part of the companies themselves as part of their self regulation but this particular OTT platform, Ulu, was not following these guidelines and now it is being penalized for it. It's been directed to strictly abide by the new IT rules, right? Because the matter had reached the appellate body, the self-regulatory body at the industry level, which is the Digital Publisher Content Grivance Council. So this Grivance Council, which receives complaints from users and other stakeholders, has looked into these concerns that the platform was not following the guidelines, it had not blocked adult content and it was available for minor children. That is the concern here. Minor children could access adult content, right? So that is a concern for which uh, this platform has been now penalized. Next, we have an article related to another IT Act, not Information Technology Act, but Income Tax Act. See, last year in the union budget, the government of India wanted to give a benefit to the MSME industry the micro, small, medium enterprises to benefit them with regard to the tax burden on them, the government of India introduced a feature, a provision that if these MSME firms receive the payments for their contracts on time as specified in an agreement, then this income that they have received will be deducted from taxation. They need not pay taxes on that. Let's say for example, there is a micro or a small company which has signed a contract with a medium sized enterprise. This micro company wants to procure something from the medium enterprise. They want to procure a component. Now let's say they have an agreement, a signed contract between them. Now if the payment for that transaction happens within the prescribed time frame, which is within uh, 45 days if there is no agreement and 15 days, uh, sorry 45 days if there is an agreement and 15 days in case of no agreement. Within this specified time period, if the payment is done, right? If the payment for the transaction is done, then this can be shown as a deduction as far as income tax is concerned. Clear? But however, according to the article, this provision is not benefiting the companies because in many cases, the payments are getting delayed. It's not happening within the time frame. And unfortunately, it's leading to deliberate delays as well. The medium enterprises don't pay the micro small enterprises on time so that they would like to enjoy the tax benefits instead of passing it down to micro and small enterprises. So this has led to concerns about uh, section 43 BH of the IT Act, right, which was supposed to benefit the small and micro enterprises so that they could claim deduction, tax deduction could be claimed if payments had been done on time as per the contract. 
Now, despite doing it on time, they are not able to draw the benefits. It's also leading to a cash crunch for these companies as they're making timely payments. They don't have enough operational cost as well. So that is one concern which has been flagged here. So just be familiar with this provision, uh, Section 43, BH, which was introduced into the IT Act to benefit MSME industry and offer tax deductions to micro and small enterprises. Next on page 11, we have an article referring to sandalwood. As you know, sandalwood is a very precious uh, commodity. It's endemic to the Western Ghats of Karnataka. It's known for its unique fragrance. Sandalwood oil is extracted from it. And a subspecies of sandalwood is also found in Australia. These are the two places where you find this precious tree. So in uh, the Western Ghats of Karnataka and also in Australia, you find these two subspecies of sandalwood trees, right? And the article is mentioning that sandalwood is recognized as vulnerable on the IUCN red list. That's one point I wanted to highlight. Sandalwood is recognized as vulnerable. It's a threatened species under IUCN red list because due to poaching, it faces a, a considerable risk because sandalwood trees and the oil produced from it is very valuable, very expensive. You can make perfumes out of it. Uh, you can make aromatic wood, which is used for various purposes. You can even produce cosmetic products, including the Mysore sandal soap, right? And today, the world's largest producer of sandalwood and sandalwood oil is Australia. Note down this point as well. Australia is the world's largest producer of sandalwood trees and sandalwood oil. The last point I would like to mention here is the role that birds play in the dispersal of sandalwood seeds. There are few specific birds found in this habitat in India and also in Australia. They basically consume the seed and they pass the seed through their digestive tract. And this is very important as far as the germination and propagation of the seed is concerned. Research has shown that when the seeds are consumed by the birds and if the seed passes through its digestive tract, it makes it more conducive for germination which increases the chances of propagation of the tree. And those are the ones which actually become mature very quickly. They become mature trees more quickly, thus yielding more uh, sandalwood and increasing the produce eventually. So please understand the role that birds are playing in the propagation of sandalwood. How important it is for the seeds to be digested, uh, at least for the seed to pass through the digestive tract of birds that makes the seed a uh, more viable for germination and those trees, they become more mature, leading to better yield and better produce. Now coming to the last article for today, we have two articles on page 14 referring to relations between China and Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka's leader, Prime Minister Dinesh Gunavardhane was on a visit to China to talk about Sri Lanka's economic crisis. Sri Lanka, as you know, is going through a major crisis and China until now has not really helped Sri Lanka. Even though Sri Lanka is under a lot of Chinese debt, China did not join the Paris Club of Creditors. It did not join with India and Japan, which were trying to bail out Sri Lanka and help Sri Lanka restructure its foreign debt. Paris Club of Creditors, it's a group of uh, developed economies that try to restructure the loans for countries which are under a debt burden. So India was working with the Paris Club because India is also a major creditor nation to Sri Lanka. Japan also is a major uh, lender uh, nation to Sri Lanka. So India, Japan worked together with Paris Club of countries to restructure the loans so that it could become eligible for IMF's bailout package. But however, China, which has more loans given to Sri Lanka than India and Japan, did not join the process. China said we will bilaterally negotiate with Sri Lanka will not be part of any uh, multilateral process. But China said, we'll talk to Sri Lanka, we'll restructure the loan separately. Now, this was always a matter of concern for India because we know how China leverages its economic advantage to turn that into a geopolitical advantage. And as predicted, that's exactly what China has done. It has promised to restructure the loan and reduce the debt burden on Sri Lanka. But in return, it has got hold of strategic projects at Colombo and Hambantota. 
This is what India has always been worried about. Parallelly, the BOA Forum, which is called the Asian Davos, was also held in Hainan province, where many Asian countries were participating. India is also a member of the BOA Forum for Asia. So here China has expressed uh, its desire to take up many key projects in Indian Ocean. And that is exactly what India has always been worried about. For example, if you look at Colombo port, it was China which developed the Colombo port, which is of great strategic importance. And it has won key contracts around the Colombo port as well. For example, the East Container Terminal project near Colombo port was supposed to be built by India and Japan. India, Japan, as part of their Asia-Africa growth corridor, they had won the contract to develop the East Container Terminal. But this was cancelled by the Rajpaksa brothers who came to power in 2019. They took away the project from India and uh, Japan, gave this project to a Chinese company. Is that clear? So in return, India has been compensated with the West Container Terminal project at Colombo. But now China has got the rights to further develop the port city at Colombo. A massive port city is going to be developed along with an airport at Colombo. So China has now won the contract for these strategic connectivity projects and commercial projects. If you look at Hambantota, China here already has developed a port which has become loss making. Because of this, Sri Lanka fell under a massive debt burden. Sri Lanka could never repay the loan. And as a result, Sri Lanka transferred Hambantota on lease for 99 years to a Chinese company. A few years ago, Sri Lanka, which could not bear the debt burden of Hambantota port, right? The port project had failed commercially. It was not generating enough revenue. So Chinese company took over Hambantota for management of operations for 99 years for a century. Now it has got further rights to develop other facilities at Hambantota and to maintain the port city of Hambantota. Now this is what India and even US have always been worried about. That China turns these commercial projects into a geopolitical, geostrategic project. The fear is China will further push its naval vessels and spy vessels into Colombo and Hambantota to spy on India and also on American interests. Even US has a major military base here, called Diego Gracia, in uh, Indian Ocean. India has always objected to Chinese research vessels that dock at Colombo and Hambantota. So now the risks are further aggravated because Sri Lanka has agreed to involve China again in the port city project at Colombo and the airport project and for further maintenance of Hambantota port and the related projects around Hambantota. So that is what we understand from this article. And on this note, I would like to conclude my discussion for today. So I hope you guys have enjoyed the session. Please take a look at the practice questions. You can make a note of these questions and write answers and post them in the comments. It's all based on what we have discussed in previous articles. Use the same points in the structure to build an answer and po paste the answer in the comment section below. So I hope you guys have enjoyed the session and understood everything. Do let me know what you think in the comments and also don't forget to Subscribe to our channel because we have a host of new initiatives launching starting from tomorrow. So from 1st April, we are going to start these new limited series. This will happen with every subject. We'll start with international relations from 1st to 5th April. And similarly, our other expert uh, teachers will conduct sessions on similar lines from, other, their, from their respective subjects as well throughout the month of April. Then from 1st of May, we'll be launching our Conquer Prelims Current Affairs Crash Course. So let me know what you think about the initiatives and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. That is it. I'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Have a good day.